to Genesis chapter number 8 and Genesis chapter number 9. I'm going to make it work a little bit this morning. I've seen a few of you was nodding off last week, so I'm going to make you flip through, just make you flip through some scriptures this morning. I don't often do that, but I felt this morning the need uh, to cover this. The title of the message is Thanks Be Unto God. I know we just had a, a Thanksgiving week, and I pray that you had a good time with your family and was able to come together. Uh, we're going to close out the month of November with another message about Thanksgiving. And then uh, next Sunday, like I said, Brother Brandon will be preaching. And then from that point, we'll move into some messages uh, about centered around Christmas and the birth of our Savior. But Genesis chapter 8, I'm going to read verses 20 and 22 in chapter 8. And then in chapter number 9, verses 8 through 17. If your Bible's like mine, they're on the opposite pages. You shouldn't have to flip much. If any, you'll have to flip one page. But Genesis chapter number 8, uh, verse number 20 through 22 says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. And took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And then if you look right over in chapter number 9, I'm going to read verses 8 through 17. And God spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I have made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for the perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it. And I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth from the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we do thank you, Lord, and praise you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and privilege to be in your house. And I pray this morning, Lord, that each and every one has come to receive a blessing. And I pray, Lord, as we move forward with this service, Lord, that you take the focus from me. Lord, you put it on you. You put it on your precious word and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful, Lord, that we have freedoms and privileges. So many times, Lord, we take so much for granted. And today, Lord, we are thankful. We're thankful for thy blessings and for thy grace and for thy mercy. Father, there's been many here in our congregation that are hurting, those that have lost loved ones, those that have illnesses, those that are suffering, those, Lord, without jobs. Father, the, the family that lost their home, we send a special prayer and blessing to them that you provide for them, Lord, comfort and strength. And Lord, today, as we move forward through this service, I thank you for the songs. I thank you for the little kids that have sung. I thank you, Lord, that we would have a heart as they do, that we'd be obedient to you, that we would follow, Lord, in your will. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We pray, Lord, today that our Christian hearts will be challenged. And we also pray, Lord, there might be one here that's lost that don't know Christ as their Savior. Lord, today would be a great day to be saved and begin a new life serving you. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We'll ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm a little dry. I'm going to give me a drink of water before we get started. But this Thanksgiving message I want to preach to you, we can go back to the very beginning in Genesis, and I think we can find several things uh, that Noah was thankful for, and we can see some things that God promised to Noah that we could also be thankful for. So this morning we see where we have started here in Genesis, 
Uh, you all know the story very well, and, and I'm going to preach a little bit about God's confirmation. And this morning, Mr. Brim's tie is my confirmation of this message. Some people say, why in the world would you preach a message about Noah and the flood for the day, the week after Thanksgiving or the approach of Christmas? But God gives us confirmation, and this morning, Mr. Brim, he sent it by you with your tie, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for being obedient this morning and wearing your, your Noah's Ark tie. I appreciate it. Amen. And God does that. God, God gives that. I'm gonna, that's part of my sermon this morning. But here, Noah, we know the story. He was obedient to God. Uh, God had spoke to Noah and called him out that he had given him instructions, very specific, detailed instructions. And I've said before, when God gives us instructions, they are specific and detailed. His word is specific. It is detailed for each and every one of us. And we need to follow those details and those specifications that he has for our life. But he had, he had put uh, Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives into the ark. God shut the door. Uh, there was two of every kind of animal in that ark. And we know the story. The rains came. The winds blew. The earth was flooded. It was destroyed. And then the ark came to rest on a mountain called Mount Eric. And uh, many people say today, oh, well, if this, this would have happened, uh, why can we not find this ark, this great ship that God constructed? And I, I don't know the theological answer to that, but I've heard some people say that if God would have allowed that ark to be found, that we would have worshipped that ark. We would have, instead of taking the focus to God, we would have worshipped that ark. And I believe that's true. I believe that it has a lot of merit to it. But I believe it, it, if God wants us to see it or find it, then one day uh, we certainly will. But until then, we have his living word. We have the accurate depiction of what the ark was like. But when Noah uh, came out of the ark, uh, I want to start today's message about something that we can be thankful for. Um, what Noah did in chapter 8, verse number 20 and 22. Flip back there real quick. It said in, in verse number 20 that Noah built an altar unto the Lord. He built an altar unto the Lord. And I find it interesting as Noah came out of this uh, time that he was on there, he was thankful that the Lord had saved him, the Lord had saved his family. Now, he could have been discouraged. He could have looked around and said, God has destroyed all the living creatures. He could have went around, if it had been you or I, we talked a little bit about our nature in Sunday school this morning, we'd have been looking for somebody to say, I told you so, but guess what? There was nobody to say, I told you so too. It was Noah and his family. And he came out of there and he was thankful and he built an ark and he began to worship the Lord. So this morning, the first thing that we can find that we need to be thankful for is our freedom to worship. Our freedom to worship. We are in, in very difficult times. And I tell you that I take uh, our worship very serious. And I, I'm so thankful that we have the opportunity and privilege to gather together as a church to worship our Lord. And I think that's vitally important. I don't think man has the right or the ability to take that from us. Now, we have been in prayer. We have been in constant decisions on what we need to do to try to keep everybody safe here. I've asked you to try to wear your mask when you're in the common areas, and many of you are obeying that, and we appreciate it. We've, we've tried to spread out as much as possible. We're doing all the things that we can do, but we need to be thankful for our freedom to worship. Here, Noah came out of that ark, and what he did, he led his family in worship. And I'll encourage you here, if you're the head of your family, man or woman or grandfather, aunt or uncle, that's what we need to do. We need to establish that uh, covenant, that uh, mark with our family that we're going to worship the Lord. No matter what we're going through, we're going to worship the Lord. Brenda, I'm going to use you for an example this morning. I hope you don't mind. You could have stayed home and you could have said, I, I've been through a lot for the last two weeks, but I didn't. You came to church. You've, you've set an example for your family that you want to come to worship the Lord. And that's exactly what Noah did here. He wanted to be to his family to show that they were thankful for what the Lord had done. The Lord had provided safety for them. Many times he provides safety for us. Each and every day I pray to the Lord that he would provide a hedge of protection about my family, that he would provide a hedge of protection about this church around each and every one of us. And today I'm thankful when I come to his house with a grateful heart and a thankful heart able to worship him and thank him for that safety. Thank you for his provision. And Noah sets that example. He gives an example. But if you flip over in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, we see a different story. Luke chapter number 17. Another familiar story. I'm going to read to you verses 11 through 19. And we see here a group of ten people. It said it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met with him ten men 
that were lepers. You remember a few weeks back I preached about Naaman who had leprosy. And it said here in verse number 12, I think that all of us can relate to today, it says which he stood afar off. They were socially distancing from these lepers. But it says in verse number 13 that they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now all ten of these lepers knew that they had a problem. They knew that they had a disease that needed to be cured. And they looked and they said, Master, have mercy on us. I would encourage us today to, if we take one example from these ten lepers, that we could take that example. That we need to look to the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. You're the one that can provide mercy. You're the only one that can provide the mercy that we need. So they said, Lord, have mercy on us. They lifted up their voices. And when he saw them, he said unto them, he said, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. It reminds me of the message that I preached a few weeks back in about the story of Naaman. Remember when, when Naaman came to Elisha's house? And what did Elisha do? He sent the messenger out to greet Naaman. I said because I thought Naaman had so much pride that that's why Elisha sent the messenger out. But here the same thing. Uh, they came and Jesus told him to go to the priest. Go before the priest. Jesus uses people. He uses you and I to do his work. That's what he was doing here. He wanted to see the faith of these lepers to go to this priest. But he was using the priest as well. And he can use you and I if we allow him to do so. So, and when he saw him, it says, he said, go show yourself to the, to the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Meaning that they were healed of this leprosy. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. He fell down on his face and at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, where there are not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found and returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. We see here these ten men, each one of these ten men had been saved. They had been rescued, just like Noah and his family. And Noah came out and he set that example, and he built an altar to worship the Lord and make sacrifice to the Lord. But here these ten lepers, only one of them returned back to worship the Lord. Only one of them felt the need to come back. I wonder why. I don't have the answer. I don't know if they didn't have a good direction in their life like someone like Noah to guide them and point them back. But all of them knew that they were healed. All of them knew that Jesus was the one that could provide that healing because they said, Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us. But yet only one of them came back. But look what this one did. He fell down, down on his face at his feet, at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. And he says he was a Samaritan. He was even surprised himself that Jesus healed him because he was a Samaritan. These Samaritan people were so mistreated and so looked down upon that they even had it in their own mind that they couldn't be healed, that they couldn't be cured. But yet he's, he's standing at Jesus' feet and he's in amazement that you've healed me. And he's come back to worship him. It's a sign and a, and a symbol of worship for us. This morning, I would encourage you to be able to worship the Lord. Now, if you look outside at our church, we're forward for Christ Baptist Church. I'm as about as Baptist as you're going to find. I believe in the Baptist doctrines. I believe in, in uh, salvation only through the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in uh, baptism by immersion. But I don't believe that we can't praise and worship the Lord a little bit. I said before, there's a word that I use, Bapticostal. It, it's not going to scare me to get a little Bapticostal. If you raise your hand and praise the Lord, if you say amen... Because that's what he's doing here. That's what Noah did. When Noah came out of that ark, he was worshiping the Lord. His style of worship was different than this leper. He decided he was going to build an altar and offer sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord looked down on the altar. He looked down on the sacrifice and it was pleasing to the Lord. It said that the Lord smelled a sweet savor. I pray all the time uh, that the Lord would smell a sweet savor coming from us. I don't know. I pick on Evan all the time. I've said if you come to our house... Uh, he had a friend over last night, and Rachel almost had to have a hazmat suit fumigating his room out. And she came down, he came down dragging three handfuls of, of dishes from his room. Now pray for Navin because I've asked him, son, have you, there he is right here on the front row. <laughs> have you cleaned your room? Oh, yes, Dad, I've cleaned my room. I've cleaned it. But look, his perception of clean is different than mine and certainly different from Rachel's. The same way all of our perception of worship can be. We all worship differently. But it doesn't hurt us sometimes to raise a hand of praise to the Lord and acknowledge Him. 
It wouldn't hurt us to come up here to this altar and get down on our knees and get down on our face like this leper did and thank the good Lord for answering that prayer that we've been praying about for so long. I'm thankful today that we have the freedom and the ability to worship. There was no one out here in the parking lot with a gun telling you don't come into church this morning. There was nobody throwing rocks at you. There was nobody screaming profanity at you. I know about it because I was out on the porch. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have let them do it. But look, we have this freedom, and we take it for granted. There's so many all over this world that would love to have this freedom that we have today. To love to be able to come into this sanctuary, to sit down in these padded pews, to be able to worship the Lord. There's some that will walk this morning miles and miles to get to a little old rundown shanty of a shack that they call their church to worship the Lord. And they're doing the exact same thing we're doing. Then they're worshiping the exact same God we're doing. I'll ask you this morning, what's keeping you from worship? Is it fear? There's a, there's a little rock back on my desk, and it was here before I came, and, and we used it to put, the, put on top of papers when we transfer them back between Diane or whoever that needs these papers or receipts. And I looked at it the other day, and it says faith over fear. And that was built long or made long before this era we live in with COVID. And I told you, we need to be cautious. We do need to be smart. The good Lord's give us a brain. I heard a, a joke the other day, something about this man wasn't listening to his wife. And what did he say, Rachel? Right? Somebody's going out to the field, to, uh, the cornfield, to get between two ears oh, yeah. or something like that so he'd have a brain. Yeah. But look, the good Lord's give us, he's give us this brain for us to use. And we need to use it smarter. We need to use it wisely. Okay? But we don't need to let fear hinder us from worshiping the Lord. And if you're sitting out in the parking lot this morning, somebody listening to me out there, you're doing the exact same thing we're doing. And it's not left up to you and I to look at that person and say, they don't have as much faith as me because they didn't come into the church. That's not right. We need to, to make our own decision based on our own account of what we feel that we are comfortable doing. And the Lord will honor that. So if there's someone out in the parking lot this morning when you leave, way better. Make them feel comfortable. Make them feel a part of our church because they're here. They're worshiping the Lord as well as we are. How about pride? Does pride keep us from worshiping? Does pride keep us from worshiping? Maybe that we're, we're so prideful that we want to just hold everything to ourselves, and we don't want to truly acknowledge that God is the one that's provided for us and he's the one that we need to be worshiping. I hope and pray that it's not. Or maybe it's perception. I tell my kids all the time that we need to choose our friends wisely. We need to show the love of Christ to everybody, no matter where you're at, no matter how old you are, whether you're in school. But those that are close to you, choose your friends wisely because it's, it's, it's easier uh, to say yes than it is to, to say no. I've been guilty before. Rachel, the other day, she was on looking at Christmas shopping. And I agreed to something. I had no idea what she said until afterwards because I had blocked her out. I wasn't really paying much attention. And she said, Josh. And I said, yeah, that's fine, whatever. So I, I still, I, that'll get you in trouble. See what I'm saying? That'll get you into trouble. But it's easier. You get, I, I'm not trying to be old-fashioned, but I'm telling this group of teenagers and these kids that we have here today, when you're in a group and something's going on that ain't right, be brave and say no. It's easy to say yes, but I can tell you the consequences can be very, very detrimental to you. They can, be, they can haunt you for a long time. But it, it, is it perception? Are we worried about if I come to this altar this morning? If I'm like this one leper that come back, if I kneel down at the altar and, and thank God and worship the Lord and thank Him for answering my prayer, will the people here in the church look at me funny? Will they think, why in the world is Brother Joshua up here at the altar? I thought he was saved. I thought he was a good man. I didn't know he needed to come up here to repent. That's why the preacher says, bow your head, or bow your head. Bow your head, excuse me, I can't get it right. Bow your head and close your eyes for a reason. Because it's time for us to get personal with God. You can sit in your seat if God's not convicting you and speaking to your heart. Sit in your seat and be quiet and obedient to allow the one that is coming forward. And maybe they won't worry about the perception as much. So we see all of these things. But here in Genesis 8, we can see that Noah give us that example. And then in the New Testament, that one leper, that one leper give us that example. And I'm thankful today, and I hope that you are, that we have that freedom for worship. Nothing's holding us back. Nothing's holding you back. And don't get offended when I say this from you worshiping the Lord, except for Satan, except for the devil. When we give in to all these things, he's, he's the one that's worshiping. He's the one that's clapping a hand and praising and saying, oh, I've, I've kept them in their seat. I've kept them out of church. We don't need to let that happen. We need to be thankful for our worship and for our ability to worship. And then we'll move into to chapter number nine. And I want to say the second thing we need to be thankful for, and that's God's promises. 
After Noah had come out of this ark and he had built this offer of sacrifice to the Lord, he made this promise to Noah. And the Bible says here that Noah, that God spoke unto Noah and his sons. And I want you to mark that because I don't know what has happened here, but prior to this, all through Genesis up until this point, God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Noah. But here in verse number 8, he spoke to Noah and his sons. I don't know if, if those sons were obedient to Noah and they went into that ark because their father had told them to do so. There's another example for you. Never write that down when your father tells you to do something, you do it. But I believe maybe on that ark, maybe there was some type of experience that they had that their faith was strengthened in the Lord. I won't be as bold to go out and say that maybe those three sons were saved on that ark. We know that they were physically saved because they were in there with him. But here God starts conversing with them as well as he does Noah. And he goes on. I'm not going to read it word for word to you this morning for the sake of time. But he establishes a covenant. He establishes a covenant with Noah. And he says that no more will I destroy the earth with a flood. And here's where some of the Bible skeptics and more liberal preachers and churches will tell you, oh, well, you can't take this for real. You can't take this account in Genesis of creation for real. You can't take this account of Noah and this ark for real because God told Noah he wasn't going to destroy the earth with the flood, yet every day we see on the news or on TV of floods. And that's not what he's talking about. He said he wasn't going to destroy the entire earth with the flood. It doesn't mean that we're not going to experience a flood here in our little valley. It doesn't mean that, that we're going to have uh, natural disasters all throughout the world. But what it says here that he will not destroy mankind with the flood. He made that promise to Noah and he gave him these promises. Amen. Turn with me again to just over a little bit to Genesis 28. Verse number 15. I want to show you promises that the Lord gives us out of one verse. It's amazing. I could have chose this one verse today and preached an entire message from this one verse. I'm not brave enough. I'm too young of a pastor yet to do that. I've got to go through and back my message up with scriptures. But look, we could have taken today and had preached one solid message out of this verse. Genesis 28, verse number 15. He says, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now, this is not the, 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 the instruction that he gives to Noah, but I think we could apply that to Noah's life. Each and everything that he says here, I am with thee. He says, I will keep thee. He says, I will be with thee where places wherever you go. It's, that was where Noah was at on that ark. But guess what? It's the same as you and I. We could say this every day, Lord. We could start our morning devotions out with this prayer from Genesis 28, 15 and say, Lord, you promised it to me. Be with me. Keep me in all places, wherever I go. Bring me again to this land, and don't leave me until you have done unto me what you have spoken to me of. We can see in these things that these promises that God gives us, he's promised that he'll be with us. He'll be with us no matter where we're at, no matter where our journey takes us, whether we were like Noah and we're in a, in a, in a boat in the midst of a storm and a flood, whether we're high up on this valley and things are going absolutely perfect for you. You might not relate to anything that I've said this morning because you're at the, the high point of your life. I can tell you, I don't want to preach doom and gloom to you, but enjoy it. Hold on to it because it's not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. I've heard old preachers say that you're either in a trial, you're finishing up your trial, or you're getting ready to go into a trial. That's, that's, the, that's the process and the nature of life. But he tells us here in, in Genesis 28, he says, I'll be with you. He says, I am with thee. And then he tells us that he will protect us. He will keep us. Just like he kept Noah and his wife and his three sons and his three daughter-in-laws in, safe inside that ark, he'll keep us. He'll protect us. Amen. Sometimes the protection, Brother Jimmy, that we see is not what we think we need, but it's what God gives us. He'll protect Amen. us. And then he'll be our strength. He'll be our strength in these times of trouble, in these times that we're going through this, this era of fear that we're in, uh, in division within our country. He'll, he'll be our strength. He'll give us strength. It's not I. It's not what I can do. It's what Christ can do through me. And that should be our prayer. You might think that you're, you're unworthy. I've, I've, I've used this quote before. You'll hear me say it again. God doesn't call qualified people. He qualifies those that are called. Amen. And he, he ends this verse here in 28, 15. He says that he will strengthen us. He will keep us. He will answer us 
until I have done that which I have spoken to you, until what you are called to do, he'll keep you. He'll protect you. He'll give you strength. And then he'll answer you. I'm glad that God answers our prayers. Amen. I'm glad that he answers our prayers through some of these promises that he's given us. I mentioned here in chapter 9, verse number 8, that God had up until this point only spoken up to Noah. But here he starts conversing with his sons and well, his well. I'm thankful that God answers our prayers. Again, many times these prayers might not be the answer that we want to hear. And it's hard for us to accept those things. But we need to know and acknowledge that God is speaking to us. I heard a, a joke said this man was uh, uh, hiking. And he was with his wife and he was trying to show off. And he got too close to the edge and he fell. And he, he was lucky he grabbed onto this branch. And he hollered and he told his wife, he said, you run back and get help. And he was hanging on to that branch and he hollered up. He looked up into the sky and said, Lord, if you're there, talk to me, speak to me. And the Lord answered this fellow and he said, okay. He said, I've got you. Just let go. I'll put something underneath of you to catch you. He sat there and thought about it. He looked back up. He said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> you see, we, sometimes we need, to, we need to know when God's speaking to us. And it's not many times when we're in those prayers. I, I, that was obviously a joke. I'm not telling you to go out here and, and jump off the building because that's just plain stupid, not living on faith. But look, that man didn't like the answer that the Lord had given. And he wanted to, to see if there's anybody else up there that, that could do it. I heard another, I don't want to tell, tell a lot of jokes, but uh, this was really good. I heard it this week, and it, well, I mentioned already about us being Baptist. So, uh, and there's this persona that Baptists, you know, we think that we've, we're the best and we do everything the best way. So this, this group of people had died and they were going to heaven. And uh, I don't believe this either. I believe that when we're accepted into heaven, we, we go right in the presence of God. I don't know if St. Peter is going to meet us at the gate. That's just the joke that he used. But this first person went in, and St. Peter was there, and he said, uh, what's your denomination? And the, the guy said, well, I'm a brethren. He said, okay, well, you go down to room number 12. So he goes, he said, but you be real quiet when you go past room 7. He said, okay, I got you. So the next guy came up there, and he said, St. Peter, I made it. Where, where, where would I go? He said, well, what's your denomination? He said, well, I'm a Pentecostal. He said, well, you need to be really, really quiet. You go on down to room 14, but you be real quiet when you pass room 7. So they're thinking, what in the world's going on? So the next guy comes by, and he's a Methodist. And he said, St. Peter asked me, he said, Where, which room should I go to? He said, well, you, you're, you're, what are you? What denomination are you? He said, I'm a Methodist. He said, oh, well, you, you can go into room 1. He said, you're not going to pass by room 7, so you don't have to be so quiet. So the Methodist brave enough, he said, what in the world's going on in room 7? He said, oh, that's where the Baptists are, and they think they're the only ones in heaven. <laughs> so you see, we can have a little bit of humor as well. But look, God, God speaks to us, and we need to, to be obedient to that. He Not only does he speak to us, he will answer us. He'll provide for us. He will give us peace through that journey, and he will, he will always love us. No matter where we're at through that journey, no matter if we fail, no matter if we don't acknowledge the answer to his prayer, no matter if we fail to come and worship the Lord and give him the honor and give him the glory, he will not quit loving us. He will always love us. The Bible Amen. says that he's, he has us in his hand. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. So this morning, I'm thankful that we have freedom to worship, and I'm thankful for God's promises. And then I told you, I said we're going to talk about confirmation. I'm thankful for God's confirmation because many times he answers our prayers through confirmation. I said this morning the confirmation for our message was sent by someone who wore a tie. Many times it's sent in different ways. You might be open up your Bible just to start reading and the Lord points you right to a specific verse and it speaks to your heart. It speaks to the very situation that you're going through and just by chance you had opened up your Bible to that verse. I don't believe it's by chance. I believe it's because God wanted you to see it. God wanted you to read it. He gave Noah and his sons a confirmation. He says, I'm not going to destroy the earth by the means of a flood ever again. And in order for me to, to, to look at that, I, I, God doesn't forget. He's not forgetful. But he says here he needs that rainbow that he can look at to show himself that he's given confirmation to the world, to all flesh, to all mankind, that he wouldn't destroy the world again. Some, some of you might be on the radio or listen to the radio in your car and hear a, a specific song or a specific message that comes on the radio and God speaks to you and he gives you that confirmation. 
Now, I know I, I've got this in my notes, and I probably realize it doesn't relate to any of you, but believe it or not, sometimes your preacher has to wait till the day before the day that his bills are due to pay him. So instead of mailing his bills off, he, he calls on the phone or, or goes on the computer and does it, and they give you a confirmation number. And that's what God was literally saying here. I know that's corny. I know you think that's, that's cheesy, but it's the way God said, I'm going to give you a confirmation. God will give you confirmation in your life. If you feel like you're called to do something, God will give you confirmation that you'll be called to do it. I spoke a few weeks back and told you that back April of 2000, it's been five years, 2015, that I was burnt. And I was burnt on the left side of my arm and my face, had second degree burns on my arm and my face. And uh, I had got up early that morning and went outside to do things and ended up getting burnt by a brush fire. And I did read my morning devotionals. I try every day. I'm not telling you that I'm faithful and do it every day, but I try not just my Bible reading, but to, to read a morning devotion. I get them by email. And that morning I had forgot to read that devotion. And several days later, I told Rachel, I said, bring me my phone. I want to catch up on my devotions. And the Lord, the, the devotion that I was supposed to have that morning talked about being tried by fire. And the Lord just spoke to my heart and, and just it just confirmed to me that everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. I mentioned uh, in our opening prayers about Charlie Sarris' family. Now, I grew up with Charlie. We've known each other for a long, long time. And my heart goes out to, to his family. And uh, one of the police officers at the funeral service told a story. I don't know if anybody went or watched it on, uh, on the live stream. But they said when he was going to Texas a little over a month ago for his cancer treatments, that through the window of the cars, that a, a rainbow actually shined in the window. Now, I've never had that happen to me. I've drove and drove and drove, and we've seen rainbows, but I've never driven through one. But they said that you could actually see it through the car. It said it was his, they was telling him that he said that's his way of saying that God's going to take care of him. He's going to be okay. And then after he passed, they parked his police cruiser up here at the police station, at the sheriff's department, and they made like a little memorial. People brought flowers and different things there. And in the picture that somebody took and posted, sure enough, there was a rainbow there. And it said that was confirmation sent him back to his family that he was okay. And I, I don't know how accurate all those things are, but I do know that it's possible. And I do know that God gives us uh, confirmation. But one thing he uses is people. He'll use you and I to be somebody's confirmation. Don't, don't be a stumbling block. Be obedient to the Lord. Amen. Be obedient to the Lord. If the Lord calls you to come worship the Lord this morning, if he calls you to come and pray for somebody, if he, if he tells you to just to, I'm not encouraging you to shake hands. I can't do that right now. But look, if he's encouraging you to give you a fist bump or an elbow, be obedient to it. You might not know that person. You might not know who they are, but you might be the confirmation that they've been waiting for and to hear. And then there's always a result. We see that there was a result here. God had saved Noah. He had saved his wife, his three sons, his daughter-in-laws. And God said, I'm not going to do that anymore. Whenever God gives us confirmation, he gives them that rainbow. And after that came a result. That he told Noah, his sons, he said, you've got a job to do. You've got to go out and replenish the earth from this, this point on. He said, I, I'm no longer going to destroy the earth. And the Lord, in all those confirmations, he'll have a result. I want to close out the service this morning in the Gospel of Mark. Chapter number 15. I'll read to you verse 33 through 39. It says, And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Elah, Elah, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I'll stop here and pause just one, just really quickly and tell you that people say, oh, you're not supposed to question the Lord. You're not supposed to ask why. I, I can't find it anywhere through in my Bible that says that, that I'm not supposed to ask God why. I see a lot of the prophets and a lot of the, the men in the Old Testament. Uh, Noah questioned God as to, to if he should build this ark. Moses questioned God whether he should be the, the one to bring the children of Israel out. Uh, Job questioned the Lord. Many times the disciples question the Lord, but here the Lord himself said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then, and some of them, it says in verse 35, of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calls Elijah. And one ran and he filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let it alone, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. 
They was they was mocking the Lord, saying, "Okay, you're you're crying out to your God. Let's see how let's see how big your God is. Let's see if He'll come and get you down from this cross." And then it says, "Jesus cried with a loud voice, and He gave up the ghost." I want you to look at that verse number thirty-seven and know that that the Lord certainly did suffer pain for our sins. But I believe it not just was He suffering pain here for our sins, but He was worshiping the Lord, knowing that it was over knowing that his suffering was over, and he cried out with a loud voice. It doesn't say that he cried out with pain. It doesn't really say why he cried out. But it says he cried out with a loud voice. He gave up the ghost. I believe here, partially, he was worshiping the Lord. And then we see the result of this confirmation in verse 38. It says, The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he cried, that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And there was also women looking on, afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and Salome. But here we see this, that God, through this confirmation, uh, he had prophesied this point that Jesus would have to die on the cross for our sins. It is finished, it's over. And in the Gospel of Luke, if you mark that and look later, it says that the earth actually shook when Jesus gave up the ghost when he died. It's, it's like the good Lord was sending confirmation again. But more importantly, it says that the, that, that curtain, that that veil was ripped in two. It was torn in two from top to bottom. That's the result of God dying for your sins, of sending his son to die on the cross for our sins. Right. That was the result of the confirmation that he sent to us, that we have direct access to the Lord. Here in the Old Testament where I started out with Noah, Noah wanted to communicate with the Lord, and the Lord had verbally spoken to Noah. But he felt that he needed to build that altar, that altar and offer sacrifice to God. Here, when Jesus died on the cross and God sent the confirmation, the result was that we no longer have to go and build that altar. The altar was the cross, and Jesus was the sacrifice. He paid the price for you and I. Amen. And when that temple, when that curtain on that temple was ripped in two, it means that we have direct access to God. It doesn't mean that you just have to come to church to worship the Lord. You can worship the Lord in the parking lot. You can worship the Lord in your car. You can worship the Lord at your house, at your work, wherever you're at. We can go to the Lord and thank Him for His promises in prayer anytime, anywhere. I said, I'm thankful that I don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to call me and say, Brother Josh, I'd like to come in and pray. That's not how it works. You don't have to have me there to pray. I'll be glad to pray with you, but you've got direct access to God. All you got to do is get down on your knees, wherever you're at. You don't even have to get down on your knees. Just ask God to come into your heart and pray with you, and he'll do it. Amen. So today, I would encourage us as we end out this season of Thanksgiving uh, of November, and we look forward to the time of our birth of our Savior, that we for, don't forget to be thankful each and every day. But uh, be thankful for our opportunity and our privilege to worship. Be thankful for the promises that God has given us, and be thankful for the confirmation that he sends to our lives. I'm going to ask you this morning if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes. Susie's going to come to the piano and then we'll pray.